Chapter 5 of Is Mars Habitable? This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Is Mars Habitable? By Albert Russell Wallace. Chapter 5 The Temperature of Mars. Mr. Lowell's Estimate We have now to consider a still more important and fundamental question, and one which Mr. Lowell does not grapple with in this volume, the actual temperature on Mars due to its distance from the sun and the atmospheric conditions on which he himself lays so much stress. If I am not greatly mistaken, we shall arrive at conclusions on the subject which are absolutely fatal to the conception of any high form of organic life being possible on this planet. The Problem of Terrestrial Temperatures In order that the problem may be understood and its importance appreciated, it is necessary to explain the now generally accepted principles as to the causes which determine the temperatures on our Earth and, presumably, on all the other planets whose conditions are not wholly unlike ours. The fact of the internal heat of the Earth, which becomes very perceptible even at the moderate depths reached in mines and deep moorings, and at the deepest mind becomes a positive inconvenience, leads many people to suppose that the surface temperatures of the Earth are partly due to this cause. But it is now generally admitted that this is not the case the reason being that all the rocks and soils in their natural compacted state are exceedingly bad conductors of heat. A striking illustration of this is the fact that a stream of lava often continues to be red-hot at a few feet depth for years after the surface is consolidated, and is hardly any warmer than that of the surrounding land. A still more remarkable case is that of a glacier on the southeast side of the highest cone of Etna, underneath a lava stream with an intervening bed of volcanic sand only ten feet thick. This was visited by Sir Charles Lyell in 1828, and his second time thirty years later, when he had made a very careful examination of the strata, and was quite satisfied that the sand and the lava stream together had actually preserved this mass of ice, which neither the heat of the lava at its first outflow, nor the continued heat rising from the great volcano below it, had been able to melt it or perceptibly to diminish it in thirty years. Another fact that points in the same direction is the existence over the whole floor of the deepest oceans of ice-cold water, which, originating in the polar seas, owing to its greater density, it sinks and creeps slowly along the ocean bottom to the depths of the Atlantic and Pacific. It is not perceptibly warmed by the internal heat of the Earth. Now the solid crust of the Earth is estimated as at least about 20 miles in average thickness. And, keeping in mind the other facts just referred to, we can understand that the heat from the interior passes through it with such extreme slowness as not to be detected at the surface, the varying temperatures of which are due entirely to solar heat. A large portion of this heat is stored up in the surface soil, and especially in the surface layer of the oceans and seas, thus partly equalizing the temperatures of day and night, of winter and summer so as greatly to ameliorate the rapid changes of temperature that would otherwise occur. Our dense atmosphere is also of immense advantage to us as an equalizer of temperature, charged as it almost always is with a large quantity of water vapor. This latter gas, when not condensed into cloud, allows the solar heat to pass freely to the earth, but it has the singular and highly beneficial property of absorbing and retaining the dark or lower-grade heat given off by the Earth, which would otherwise radiate into space much more rapidly. We must therefore always remember that very nearly, if not quite, the whole of the warmth we experience on the Earth is derived from the Sun. See footnote 8 at the end of the chapter. In order to understand the immense significance of this conclusion, we must know what is meant by the whole heat or warmth, as unless we know this, 
we cannot define what half or any other proportion to the sun heat really means. Now I feel pretty sure that nine out of ten of the average educated public would answer the following question incorrectly. The mean temperature of the southern half of England is about 48 degrees Fahrenheit. Supposing the Earth received only half the sun heat it now receives, what would then be the probable mean temperature of the south of England? The majority would, I think, answer at once about 24 degrees Fahrenheit. Nearly as many would perhaps say 48 degrees Fahrenheit is 16 degrees above the freezing point, therefore half the heat received would bring us down to 8 degrees above the freezing point, or 40 degrees Fahrenheit. Very few, I think, would realize that our share of the half of the amount of the sun heat received by the Earth would probably result in reducing our mean temperature to about 100 degrees Fahrenheit below the freezing point, and perhaps even lower. This is about the very lowest temperature ever experienced on the Earth's surface. To understand how such results are obtained, a few words must be said about the absolute zero of temperature. The zero of temperature. Heat is now believed to be entirely due to ether vibration, which produces a correspondingly rapid vibration of the molecules of matter, causing it to expand and producing all the phenomena we term heat. We can conceive this vibration to increase indefinitely, and thus there would appear to be no necessary limit to the amount of heat possible. But we cannot conceive it to decrease definitely at the same uniform rate, as it must soon inevitably come to nothing. Now it has been found by experiment that gases under uniform pressure expand one two hundred and seventy third of their volume for each degree centigrade of increased temperature so that in passing from zero degrees centigrade to 273 degrees centigrade, they are doubled in volume. They also decrease in volume at the same rate for each degree below zero degrees centigrade, the freezing point of water. Hence, if this goes on to minus 273 degrees centigrade, a gas will have no volume, or it will undergo some change of nature. Hence, this is called the zero of temperature, or the temperature to which any matter falls which receives no heat from any other matter. It is also sometimes called the temperature of space, or of the ether in a state of rest, if that is possible. All the gases have been proved to become first liquid, and then most of them solid, at temperatures considerably above the zero. The only way to compare the proportional temperatures of bodies, whether in the Earth or in space, is therefore by means of a scale beginning at this natural zero. Instead of those scales founded in the artificial zero of the freezing point of water, or as in Fahrenheit's 32 degrees below it. Only by using the natural zero and measuring continuously from it can we estimate temperatures in relative proportion to the amount of the heat received. This is termed the absolute zero, and so that we can start reckoning from that point, it does not matter whether the scale adopted is the centigrade or that of Fahrenheit. The Complex Problem of Planetary Temperatures Now, if, as is with the case with Mars, a planet receives only half the amount of solar heat that we receive, owing to its greater distance from the sun. And if the mean temperature of our Earth is 60 degrees Fahrenheit, this is equal to 551 degrees Fahrenheit on the absolute scale. It would therefore appear very simple to have this amount and obtain 275.5 degrees Fahrenheit as the mean temperature of that planet. But this result is erroneous, because the actual amount of sun heat intercepted by a planet is only one condition out of many that determine its resulting temperature. Radiation, that is, loss of heat, is going on concurrently with gain, and the rate of loss varies with the temperature according to a law recently discovered, the loss being much greater at high temperatures in proportion to the fourth power of the absolute temperature. 
then again, the whole heat intercepted by a planet does not reach its surface unless it has no atmosphere. When it has one, much is reflected or absorbed according to complex laws dependent on the density and the composition of the atmosphere. Then again, the heat that reaches the actual surface is partly reflected and partly absorbed according to the nature of that surface, land or water, desert or forest, or snow-clad. That part which is absorbed being the chief agent in raising the temperature of the surface and of the air in contact with it. Very important, too, is the loss of heat by radiation from these various heated surfaces at different rates, while the atmosphere itself sends back to the surface an ever-varying portion of both this radiant and reflected heat according to distinct laws. Further difficulties arise from the fact that much of the sun's heat consists of dark or invisible rays, and it cannot therefore be measured by the quantity of light only. From this rough statement it will be seen that the problem is an exceedingly complex one, not to be decided offhand or by any simple method. It has, in fact, been usually considered as, strictly speaking, insoluble and only to be estimated by a more or less rough approximation, or by the method of a general analogy from certain known facts. It will be seen from what has been said in previous chapters that Mr. Lowell, in his book, has used the latter method, and by taking the presence of water and water vapor in Mars, proved by the behavior of the snowcaps and of the bluish color that results from their melting, has deduced a temperature above the freezing point of water, as prevalent in the equatorial regions permanently and in the temperate and arctic zones during a portion of each year. Mr. Lowell's Mathematical Investigation of the Problem But as this result has been held to be both improbable in itself and founded on no valid evidence, he is now in the London, Edinburgh, and Dublin Philosophical Magazine of July 1907, published an elaborate paper of fifteen pages entitled A General Method for Evaluating the Surface Temperatures of the Planets, with special reference to the temperature of Mars, by Professor Percival Lowell. And in this paper, by what purports to be strict mathematical reasoning based on the most recent discoveries as to the laws of heat, as well as on measurements or estimates of the various elements and constants used in the calculations. He arrives at a conclusion strikingly accordant with what I put forward in the recently published volume. Having myself neither mathematical nor physical knowledge sufficient to enable me to criticize this elaborate paper, except on a few points, I will here limit myself to giving a short account of it, so as to explain its method of procedure, after which I may add a few notes on what seem to me doubtful points, while I also hope to be able to give the opinions of some more competent critics than myself. Mr. Lowell's Mode of Estimating the Surface Temperature of Mars the author first states that Professor Young, in his General Astronomy of 1898, makes the mean temperature of Mars 223.6 degrees absolute by using Newton's law of heat being radiated in proportion to temperature, and 363 degrees absolute, which is equivalent to minus 96 degrees Fahrenheit, by Dulong and Pettit's law but adds that a closer determination has been made by Professor Moulton, using Stefan's law, that radiation is as the fourth power of the temperature, whence results a mean temperature of minus 31 degrees Fahrenheit. These estimates assume identity of atmospheric conditions of Mars and the Earth. But as none of these estimates take account of the many complex factors which interfere with such direct and simple calculations, Mr. Lower then proceeds to enunciate them, and to work out mathematically the effects they produce. Number 1. The whole radiant energy of the sun on striking a planet becomes divided as follows. Part is reflected back into space, part absorbed by the atmosphere, part transmitted to the surface of the planet. This surface again reflects a portion, and only the balance goes left to warm the planet. 
Number two, to solve this complex problem, we are all helped by the albedos or intrinsic brilliancy of the planets, which depend on the proportion of the visible rays which are reflected and which determines the comparative brightness of the respective surfaces. We also have to find the ratio of the invisible to the visible rays and the heating power of each. Number three. He then refers to the actinometer and pyroheliometer, instruments for measuring the actual heat derived from the sun, and also the bolometer, an instrument invented by Professor Langley for measuring the invisible heat rays, which he has proved to extend to more than three times the length of the whole heat spectrum as previously known, and has also shown that the invisible rays contribute 68% of the sun's total energy. See footnote 9 at the end of the chapter. 4. There then follows an elaborate estimate of the loss of heat during the passage of the sun's rays through our atmosphere from experiments made at different altitudes and from the estimated reflective power of the various parts of the Earth's surface, rocks and soil, ocean, forest, and snow, the final result being that three-fourths of the whole sun heat is reflected back into space, forming our albedo while only one-fourth is absorbed by the soil and goes to warm the air and determine our mean temperature. 5. We now have another elaborate estimate of the comparative amounts of heat actually received by Mars and the Earth, dependent on the very different amounts of atmosphere, and this estimate depends almost wholly on the comparative albedos that of Mars is observed by astronomers being 0.27, while ours has been estimated in a totally different way as being 0 0.75. Whence he concludes that nearly three-fourths of the sun heat that Mars receives reaches the surface and determines its temperature, while we get only one-fourth of our total amount. Then, by applying Stephen's law, that the radiation is as the fourth power of the surface temperature, he reaches the final result that the actual heating power at the surface of Mars is considerably more than on the Earth, and would produce a mean temperature of 72 degrees Fahrenheit, if it were not for the greater conservative or blanketing power of our denser and more water-laden atmosphere. The difference produced by this latter fact he minimizes by dwelling on the probability of a greater proportion of carbonic acid gas and water vapor in the Martian atmosphere and thus brings down the mean temperature of Mars to 48 degrees Fahrenheit, which is almost exactly the same as that of the southern half of England. He has also, as the result of observations, reduced the probable density of the atmosphere of Mars to two and a half inches of mercury, or only one-twelfth of that of the Earth. Critical Remarks on Mr. Lowell's Paper the last part of this paper, indicated under parts 4 and 5, is the most elaborate, occupying eight pages, and it contains much that seems uncertain, if not erroneous. In particular, it seems very unlikely that under a clear sky over the whole Earth, we should only receive at the sea level of 0 0.23 of the solar rays which the Earth intercepts, page 167. These data largely depend on observations made in California and other parts of the southern United States, where the lower part of the atmosphere is exceptionally dust-laden. Till we have similar observations made in the tropical forest regions which cover so large an area, and where the atmosphere is purified by frequent rains, and also on the prairies and the great oceans, we cannot trust these very local observations for general conclusions affecting the whole Earth. Later in the same article, page 170, Mr. Lowell says, Clouds transmit approximately 20% of the heat reaching them, a clear sky at sea level 60%. As the sky is half the time cloudy, the mean transmission is 35%. These statements seem incompatible with that quoted above. The figure he uses in his calculations for the actual albedo of the Earth, 0 0.75, is not only improbable, but almost self-contradictory, because the albedo of cloud is 0 0.72, and that of the great cloud-covered planet Jupiter is given by Lowell as 0 0.75, while Zollner made it only 0 0.62. Again, Lowell gives Venus 
an albedo of 0.92, while Zoner made it only 0.50, and Mr. Kaur 0.65. This shows the extreme uncertainty of these estimates, while the fact that both Venus and Jupiter are wholly cloud cover, although they are only half covered, renders it almost certain that our albedo is far less than Mr. Lowell makes it. It is evident that mathematical calculations found upon such uncertain data cannot yield trustworthy results. But this is by no means the only case in which the data employed on this paper are of uncertain value. Everywhere we meet with figures of somewhat doubtful accuracy. Here we have somebody's estimate quoted. There is another person's observation and they were adopted without further remark than using various calculations leading to the result above quoted. It requires a practiced mathematician, and one fully acquainted with the extensive literature of this subject, to examine these various data and track them through the maze of formula and figures so as to determine to what extent they affect the final result. There is, however, one curious oversight which I must refer to as it is a point to which I have given much attention. Not only does Dr. Lowell assume, as in his book, that the snows of Mars consist of frozen water, that there therefore is water on the surface and water vapor in its atmosphere. Not only does he ignore altogether Dr. Johnstone Stoney's calculations with regard to it, which I have referred to, but he uses terms that imply that water vapor is one of the heavier components of our atmosphere. The passage is at page 168 of the Philosophical Magazine. After stating that owing to the very small barometric pressure in Mars, water would boil at 110 degrees Fahrenheit, he adds, the sublimation at lower temperatures will be correspondingly increased. Consequently, the amount of water vapor in the Martian air must on that score be relatively greater than our own. Then follows this remarkable passage. Carbon dioxide, because of its greater specific gravity, would also be in relatively greater amount, so far as this cause is considered. For the planet's wood part Cateris Paribus, with its lighter gases the quickest. Whence, as regards both water vapor and carbon dioxide, we have reason to think them in relatively greater quantity than in our own air at corresponding barometric pressure. I cannot understand this passage, except as implying that water vapor and carbon dioxide are among the heavier and not among the lighter gases of the atmosphere, those which the planet parts with quickest. But this is just what water vapor is, being a little less than two-thirds of the weight of air, 0 0.6225, and one of those which the planet would part with quickest, and which, according to Dr. John Stone Stoney, it loses altogether. Footnote 8. Professor J. H. Pointing, in his lecture to the British Association at Cambridge in 1904, says, The surface of the sun receives, we know, an amount of heat from the inside almost infinitesimal compared with that which it receives from the sun. And on the sun, therefore, we depend for our temperature. Footnote 9. For a short account of this remarkable instrument, see My Wonderful Century, New Edition, pages 143 to 145. Note on Professor Lowell's article in the Philosophical Magazine by J. H. Pointing, Fellow of the Royal Society, Professor of Physics at the University of Birmingham. I think Professor Lowell's results are erroneous. It was neglect of the heat stored in the air by its absorption of radiation both from the sun and from its surface. The air, thus heated, radiates to the surface and keeps up the temperature. I have sent to the Philosophical Magazine a paper in which I think it is shown that when the radiation by the atmosphere is taken into account, the results are entirely changed. The temperature of Mars, with Professor Lowell's data, still comes out far below the freezing point, still further below than the increased distance alone would make it. Indeed, the lower temperature on elevated regions of the Earth's surface would lead us to expect this. I think it is impossible to raise the temperature of Mars to anything like the value obtained by Professor Lowell. 
Let us reassume some quality in his atmosphere entirely different from any found in our own atmosphere. J. H. Pointing, October 19, 1907. This is the end of Chapter 5.